Hello and a very warm welcome to Worship on the Web with St Michael's Church in Braintree. Just a few notices as we start. On Saturday the 5th of December we're having a Women at St Michael's conference. It's titled Arise Shine, Your Light Has Come and Jane Harper is going to be speaking on the subject of light. It's from 10 till 12 in the morning and if you'd like to be part of it, it'll be on Zoom. If you'd like to be part of it, do please contact Jennifer Bailey. Details are on the notice sheet. We're also uh, starting to circulate a questionnaire, both by email and in hard copy. We're looking at two things. On the first Sunday of each month, as we get back into church and are able to have services in, in the building again, first Sunday of each month we're having a family service. But on the other Sundays we're looking to the possibility of having a children's and family service over in church house at the same time as the adult service in the church building. We're also starting to think ahead towards Christmas. Our plan is to have online services and as long as we're able to to have services in church and in church house as well. Details of it and a, an outline of our thoughts are with the questionnaire and we'd really appreciate, if you're a member of the, the church family, we'd really appreciate uh, your views and thoughts on, on both the children's and family services and on our Christmas plans. It would be helpful if you could get back to us by uh, two weeks time, Sunday the 6th of December. The last thing, uh, an advance notice, next week we'll be launching a gift day uh, for the work at St Michael's. Well today's what we call Suffering Church Sunday. Each year we have a particular Sunday when we focus on uh, the persecuted church. We're delighted to have with us David Dean uh, from the Barnabas Fund and I'm going to be interviewing him shortly and he'll be speaking to us as well. But as we begin, a prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your fatherly care of the church worldwide. We particularly lift before you the persecuted church and as we reflect on the suffering that there is please grant us a grace and love towards those who suffer so much for the service of your name help us to know your presence with us today we pray amen our opening hymn is a great hymn of praise do join in, the words will be on the screen. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
our sins are sometimes described both as sins of commission and sins of omission. That is, sins of commission in the sense of the wrong things that we do and say and think. But also sins of omission, the good things that we could do, but we don't. And in relation to the suffering church, the persecuted church, perhaps we're more prone to those sins of omission. Perhaps considering those who suffer so much for the sake of the gospel as being rather out of sight and out of mind. Our confession today is a responsive one. When I say, Lord be merciful, you can join in if you wish to with the response, forgive us our sin. So let's be quiet for a moment as we reflect perhaps particularly on our sins of omission and then I'll lead us in this responsive confession. The words will be on the screen. Lord God, our Maker and our Redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and fail to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's great to have David Dean, Chief Executive Officer of Barnabas Fund, here with us this Sunday. David, can you tell us in a sentence what it is that Barnabas Fund does? Yes, thank you, Nigel. It's good to be with you. Barnabas Fund is an aid agency for the persecuted church. So we bring help and hope to Christians who are persecuted and suffering and we do that by working from Christians, channeling their gifts through Christians and churches in areas and countries where Christians are persecuted to Christians. So from Christians, through Christians, to Christians. Great, thank you, David. And we're calling this our Suffering Church Sunday as we think about the persecuted church. But could you just give us a flavour of, of what persecution for some Christians is like worldwide? Yes, so persecution is sadly on the increase and becoming increasingly violent. So Barnabas Fund has been going a little over 25 years. And when we started, it was often a case of discrimination um, and there might be occasional reports of violent persecution, but that's just um, spiraling in many ways. For example, in Nigeria, um, whereas parts of the country are safe, other parts are not. 6,000 Christians have been killed in anti-Christian violence in the last five years. Mm -hmm. And um, at least one in 10 Christians around the world will suffer persecution. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's really quite shocking numbers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and just to be a bit more specific, I know that your, your family uh, originated in Pakistan. Yes. Uh, can you give us a sense of what it's like for Christians there? Okay. 
my my dad left Pakistan 50 years ago and came to the UK to work in the National Health Service. And Pakistan, although it was created to protect Muslims and other minorities, the reality is that Christians as a religious minority within that nation are discriminated against in the healthcare, housing, education, employment, in every aspect of life. Occasionally that can be violent and also specifically the blasphemy law is used against um, many, but particularly and a significant proportion of Christians, which carries a death penalty. Um, Asia Bibi was a very famous case. She was released, but there are many Christians still uh, in Pakistan on death row, and Christians will face a systemic persecution day to day, which often would result in violent persecution from time to time. Right, right. Uh, in a moment, we're going to see a video that, that out outlines the range of kinds of work that Barnabas Fund does. Uh, but if people want to find out more about the Barnabas Fund, uh, what's the best way to do it? Yes, please do have a look on our website, Barnabas Fund. Dot org and our magazine is available. It's free. We produce it six times a year. It's also on the internet, but please do sign up to receive that plus prayer requests as well. Great, thank you, David. Yes, and I just say uh, sort of an in-house in notice, as it were. Um, Peter Shard is our Barnabas Fund rep for St Michael's Church, so people uh, can either look on the website uh, or. or or be in touch with Peter Shard and he can pass information on to you. But thank you so much, David, for being with you. We really look forward to what you've got to share for us in the talk later in the service. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks a lot, Nigel. Thanks. Galatians states, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Over the past 25 years, Barnabas Fund has committed to serving the persecuted church and championing the rights of suffering Christians worldwide, ensuring that critical aid and resources are delivered from Christians, through Christians, to Christians, helping those who face discrimination, persecution and oppression for their faith in Jesus Christ. Barnabas Fund's mission is to provide practical and spiritual aid to those who need it the most, and we provide this in many forms. Our leadership training is raising up the next generation of leaders, equipping and engaging them in the cause of Christ. Barnabas Fund is constructing new church buildings to provide Christians with dedicated places of worship. We also provide care and support to those who've converted from Islam and other religions. In situations of natural disaster, we work through local partners to act quickly, getting vital aid and help to those Christians who need it the most. We seek to help victims of violence rebuild their lives and stand strong in their faith in often difficult circumstances. In the past year, Barnabas Fund has carried out feeding programmes that have helped more than 70,000 people in 14 countries. We've equipped over 15,000 pastors and evangelists in 23 countries to preach the word of God in often dangerous situations and over 14,000 children in 12 countries have been sponsored to be supported in their education. These are only a few ways Barnabas Fund is building, equipping and supporting the persecuted church around the world. Religious freedom is a growing concern in the UK. Barnabas Fund is taking a stand against the gradual erosion of religious freedoms. These include the freedom to read scripture in public, the freedom to live out your faith in public by wearing a small cross to work or simply by openly sharing your Christian faith with others. The Our Religious Freedom campaign is a Barnabas Fund petition that has received over 90,000 signatures and we are committed to raising the awareness to the growing erosion of religious freedoms. By taking up a free subscription to Barnabas Aid magazine, you can learn about the pressures and challenges faced by those Christians persecuted around the world. We are committed to the global persecuted church. We are here to stand up for religious freedoms. We are Barnabas Fund.
It's humbling as we reflect on the extent of suffering for the sake of the gospel worldwide. In Psalm 13, David cried out to the Lord, how long? And our next song echoes that. We have sung our songs of victory and the chorus cries out, how long? The words will appear on the screen. We have sung our songs of victory We have prayed to you for rain We have cried for your compassion to renew the land again Now we're standing in your presence More hungry than before Now we're on your steps of mercy And we're knocking at your door Let us pray. A prayer for times of isolation. God of heaven and earth, in these times of isolation, apart from loved ones, distant from friends and away from neighbours, thank you for the love and care shown by strangers to our loved ones whom we are unable to visit and who are vulnerable. We thank you for the assurance that there is nothing in all of creation, not even coronavirus, that is able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. We thank you for medical workers everywhere in these challenging times, for the way they work to bring healing and restoration of health to those who are ill and showing love, care and compassion to those who are bereaved. 
Please uphold them and grant them strength that they feel, when they feel exhausted by the pressures of work. We thank you for their dedication and skills as they carry out their work day by day. Amen. Amen. A prayer for those in authority. We pray for all those in positions of power and authority, not only in our own land, but worldwide at this time of pandemic. We pray for our Queen and all those in national and local governments who have responsibilities for the welfare of our nations. Please grant them wisdom and discernment as they try to make right decisions for the good of all our fellow citizens. Father God, we ask you to raise up leaders in our national life who follow Christ, particularly praying for believers working in politics and civil service and judiciary, to act as salt and light to bring hope and encouragement at this time of lockdown. We pray especially for Nigel and all the church ministers as they seek to feed their flock in a new and different ways until we're able to worship in church again together. We thank you for the technology which allows us to have online services and meetings to help and encourage us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. We pray for those who are lonely and have sought out and joined online services which has enabled them to worship in their own homes and fed them spiritually and brought them comfort. We ask you to bless them and increase their faith. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. We pray now for schools, universities and teachers. Father God, we ask you for all those who work in education. We pray for schools, universities and for those who have responsibility for teaching in them. For students and staff to be kept safe in a very changed environment to the one they are used to. For the measures being taken to make sure they are safe as they continue their, their education. We thank you that St Michael's and all church aided schools for their dedication in upholding Christian Bible based values in an, in an ever increasing secular society. For the work with our own young people and the ability to maintain contact with them through online events and activities led by Rachel, our youth worker, CYO and Braintree Youth Project. Amen. Amen. We now turn our thoughts to our mission of the month. Today we are thinking about the work of Barnabas Fund. We've heard from Dr David Dean in the interview with Nigel and the video about the work and so we pray especially for those in Pakistan and other countries. Dear Lord, we thank you for all those who work with and for Barnabas as it champions the rights of suffering Christians worldwide, ensuring critical aid and resources are delivered from and through Christians to Christians, helping those who suffer discrimination through persecution and oppression for their faith. Please grant wisdom and courage for those in authority, in both state and in church, and we ask for your protection over Christian communities as they seek to grow and develop. We thank you that Barnabas is also supporting the persecuted church by building, equipping and supporting those in need especially their feeding programs and educational ones by training pastors and evangelists as they preach the gospel in the, to those who need to learn and know more about the love of the Lord Jesus. As we think about the persecution of Christians worldwide, we know there is growing concern in the UK about our rights to religious freedom. Barnabas is making a standard against the erosion of our rights including the right to read scripture and live out our Christian faith in public and in the places of work without discrimination. We thank you that Barnabas is also working hard in other countries across the world to maintain religious freedom for those who have faith in Jesus. We pray especially for them as they are working hard to try to get the blasphemy laws in many countries repealed. We ask for your protection for those Christians who have been charged under these laws. Many have been wrongly imprisoned for years and also those who are waiting trial. Grant them your protection and may they be exonerated and freed from detention soon. Lord, Lord we, we lift, lift these all these issues, issues to you and, and pray in, in every situation, situation 
your will and purposes will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's reading is from Exodus chapter 1. This is the English Standard Version. Exodus chapter 1. Israel increases greatly in Egypt. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there rose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm currently in the Barnabas Fund UK office in Coventry and it's good to be with you at St Michael's. If I was with you in person I'd have brought some resources for you to look at and to buy the many free resources as well but please do look on our website for details of the resources that we give that will help you to learn and to pray for persecuted Christians. Who was Shifra and who was Pua? Who were Shifra and Pua? I wonder if, like me, you didn't know much about them until reading Exodus chapter 1. The heading in the New International Version for Exodus chapter 1 is The Israelites Oppressed the Israelites oppressed. I'm going to use Exodus 1 to give a framework for the different types of persecution that happened to the Israelites in Egypt, but also the different types of persecution that happen today for many Christians around the world. I'm going to give Pakistan as a specific example and mention some of the work we do there with Christian brick kiln families. What is ruthlessness. We read earlier, or had read for us, from verses 13 and 14. The Egyptians worked them, they worked the Israelites ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labour in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labour the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. 
So what is ruthlessness? Well, if helplessness is a lack of help and hopelessness is the lack of hope, then ruthlessness is the lack of ruth. And there's an old English word from the 14th century, which has a few E's in there as well as the R-U-T-H. It means pity or compassion. And if you know the Old Testament story of Ruth, you'll see that it fits well. If you don't know it, you could read it this afternoon in a few minutes. Earlier on in the chapter, in verse 8, we read that Pharaoh said, let us deal shrewdly with the Israelites. So I want to ask, what's the difference between shrewdness and ruthlessness? Is there a difference? And the difference is one that's to do with recognising the other person as a person of worth. Christians recognise all people, regardless of their faith, as being made in God's image and therefore of worth. But many Christians, especially in nations where they are a minority, are treated as second class citizens with less worth. And in some cases, their lives are not considered worthy at all. Many of the persecution that happens to Christians around the world is a systemic persecution where they're treated in such a way that they're discriminated against. It might be health or housing, it might be education or employment. But that background systemic discrimination or persecution happens for many Christians around the world today. And Barnabas Fund help in giving them opportunities in those areas, health and housing, education, and employment as well as others. The second type of persecution that we see in Exodus 1 is hidden murder. We read that Pharaoh said to Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. This might seem more like a leap than a step, compared with the first type of persecution. And although this murder was in secret, commanded by Pharaoh to be done in secret, most persecution isn't hidden. I wonder if you can wonder why not. It's because one of the intentions of persecution is to instill fear. However, sometimes persecutors will hide their identity so that they will not be found or found guilty of that persecution. This violent persecution, I wonder, does it bring another story to mind? There's a New Testament account, the slaughter of the innocents, the targeting and murder, again, of baby boys by King Herod. Boys were targeted before Christ, and Christ himself was targeted as a boy. And I think it's of note that when Jesus was in danger as a child, his parents took him for refuge to Egypt. It's almost as if the nation of Egypt would be the first nation to know the redemptive power of Christ, even when he was a defenseless child. Many Christians have to make a choice today with far reaching consequences, whether to defy authority in order to fear God. Many parts of the church, for example, are in nations where evangelism is illegal. And Christians in those circumstances and other difficult circumstances need shrewdness. I wonder if there's any midwives in the house. And I'll ask a question to you, but it's also relevant to all mothers. Verse 19, we read that Shifra and Pua answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, they're vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Were they telling the truth? I'll leave you to discuss that perhaps in your families or over lunch. Some of us find it easier to be shrewd than others do. But Jesus commanded us to be shrewd. He said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes or as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Many persecuted Christians need shrewdness to navigate the laws in the countries in which God has placed them. 
in the same way that the Ten Boom family needed shrewdness in the Netherlands when they protected Jewish people in World War II. God knows when his followers are following. He sees it and he will reward it. We read in verse 21 that because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Because the midwives feared God by telling Pharaoh that the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, God gave them families of their own. God knows when his followers follow him. He sees it and he'll reward it in his way and in his time. Shifra and Pua were heroes of our faith. And this book, Heroes of Our Faith, gives a verse of scripture and then a short account of a Christian or group of Christians who lost their lives for the cause of Christ. And then it's followed by a hymn or a poem. It inspires me that persecution isn't new and that God has always given his family, his children, the strength and the courage to endure it. What happened earlier in the chapter with the crossing of a line between shrewdness and ruthlessness? Shrewdness acknowledges the other person as a person with worth. Ruthlessness does not. What began with crossing that line now ends in open infanticide. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. The previous instruction was given to midwives to commit a specific act in a specific hidden place. And this instruction is now given to all. Find the Hebrew baby boy and throw the boy into the river. One of our projects is a large school in India, which started because Christians saved babies who were being left to drown in a river. That project now has a boarding house and the school educates hundreds of children. I want to ask what happened next? What happened next? And after Exodus 1 comes Exodus 2. And in Exodus 2, we see the birth of Moses. Moses was saved by being placed into the same river in which Pharaoh intended him to be drowned. Many persecuted Christians are called by God to go through trials, sometimes literally trials of water or of fire. Sometimes God will miraculously deliver and at other times he delivers through the church. But remember, God is neither oblivious nor passive. He's informed and he's involved. And when God is informed and involved, he intervenes. He intervened in the life of Jesus, the birth, life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And he intervenes today. During the interview earlier, I mentioned some of the problems facing Christians in Pakistan. I've been traveling to Pakistan all my life, visiting family, visiting churches, visiting hospitals, later on lecturing medical students there. But it wasn't until last year that I visited a brick kiln. And thanks to the generous partnership of supporters, Barnabas Fund have been able to help over a thousand Christian brick kiln families by paying off their debt. It's a generational debt. I don't know whether children in Egypt worked in the fields, but in Pakistan, not only adults work in the fields, even older adults included, but children as well, instead of being given the opportunity to go to school. We've been able to pay the debt of these families so that they no longer are encumbered by, by that debt, often that has been going on for generations. We've established schools that educate many of the children. We encourage the families to send as many of their children to school as they can. We encourage them to save so that they don't have to take out a loan when they need extra money. And then also to contribute to a fund so that other families can be saved. The next phase of the project is having mobile health clinics that will meet their health needs. I want to thank you for your prayers for persecuted Christians. I want to thank Nigel for the invitation to share with you today from scripture. And I look forward to joining you shortly on Zoom. Whether our Father delivers from or delivers through, he delivers. He's not a God who is distant. He 
he's informed, he's involved, and he intervenes. Thank you so much, David, for what you've shared with us today. Thank you as well for that reminder at the end that God is not far from us. Our last song is a prayer, beauty for brokenness. It's a prayer that God will break into suffering lives, but also a prayer that God will break in to our lives, melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like rain, come change our love from a spark to a flame. Beauty for brokenness. The words will appear on the screen.
Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to consider giving towards the work of the Barnabas Fund, a link will appear at the end of this, this service and also on the service sheet. But as we end, a prayer. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your heart and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. If you'd like to join us for Zoom virtual coffee, this will take place at uh, 11 o'clock uh, on the Sunday. And David Dean will be joining us for Zoom Coffee today. Thank you.